All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Sajapur. I'm the program coordinator uh, with California Sea Grant. We're so excited to share with you today details and information on the 2023 California Sea Grant State Fellowship Program. We have a couple other members of our team. I'll invite them just to say a quick hello. Um, we have Carly, who's with our program, as well as Leon and Madeline. Do you all want to say hi? Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you all today. Hopefully we can answer some questions for you. Hi everyone, my name is Leon Gua. I use pronouns she, her, and I am the research coordinator for California Sea Grant. Hi everyone, my name is Madeline Wampler. I'm a program analyst for California Sea Grant, and I will uh, provide support for Nick along the way for the state fellows this year. Awesome, thanks you all. Appreciate you playing support in the background while we go through this webinar. And I just want to reiterate that um, this webinar will be recorded. It will be posted on the State Fellowship webpage. I put that link in the chat and we'll put it again um, in the chat, as well as if you go to our website, it's very easy to find our State Fellowship page. And with that, let's get going. So for today, um, we're just going to be using the Q&A feature. Um, so we'll try to address questions as we go. If there is a question in the Q&A that's very pertinent to the topic I'm on um, at hand, um, and if not, we have plenty of time um, to discuss at the end any questions that you might have. We, we likely will save hyper-specific questions for more individual communication. So if you have any specific questions, please send that to sgproposal at ucsd.edu. That's an alias email that can go to all of us so we can answer your question as best possible. And with that, let's get started. So I'm going to go over a big overview of the whole state fellowship program after I talk a little bit about Sea Grant, who we are, what we do, um, and why, why we're here. Um, we'll talk uh, specifically about our state fellowship. We'll go through some application tips as well as what's required for the applications. And then, like I said, we have some plenty of time at the end to answer some questions and wrap up the webinar. So who is Sea Grant? So Sea Grant is a federal state university partnership in every coastal and Great Lakes state. So uh, every, um, you can think we have, there's 34 programs across the US. We also have a program in Guam and Puerto Rico, but we are, placed at universities working on marine and coastal issues where we fund research. And we also integrate with our community to try to um, provide research to solve real world problems in those natural resource spaces. Um, so what we do is we help support we um, fellowship grants, research opportunities for scientists and graduate students. And for this fellowship, you know, those just after graduate school, um, we also administer grants for other entities and, and help support in that scientific review process. We have extension specialists and people on the ground working on a whole slew of issues um, related to the coastal and marine environment. We have a great comms uh, services and, and media piece, and we've connected with all of our other programs nationwide. So our fellowships really, you can think about these as education and training opportunities. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Um, so get used to it. This is, I want you all to, when you, the best thing to take away from this webinar is that these fellowships are training opportunities for you. Things that you can't necessarily learn in school, but to get that hands-on experience in the real world with an agency, an organization that's doing work in this coastal marine space. Um, but the main goal is to, to develop this next generation of marine and coastal leaders and provide you all training experiences. So Again, the biggest takeaway I want all of you to come out of this webinar with is that this is an educational and training opportunity. So we, um, some of you might who are more familiar with the Sea Grant might know of the Canals Fellowship. So the Canals Fellowship is is a similar experience, but it's at the federal level. It's based in Washington D.C. and it's run by our National Sea Grant Office out of Silver Springs, Maryland. And we've basically taken that concept and that model and applied it for California specifically. So this is a one-year fellowship um, in the state of California where a fellow will be placed at a, it could be a federal agency who does work in California, um, but most of our hosts are state agencies or some municipal um, organization that's really playing at this nexus of natural resource management on the coast or in the ocean. And we've been, ha we've had this program for over 30 years. And as of now we have 281 um, alumni, including our current cohort. And we're really excited about this next cohort, the 2023 cohort, because we're going to break that 300 fellow um, threshold, if you will. And it's just really exciting to see this program grow over the years um, as we have a, a great, great set of current fellows and alumni. 
And just to kind of highlight and illustrate that I love these collages because it puts some faces to that number. Um, this is just the past couple of cohorts, but you can see a whole bunch of different activities and people and folk doing different types of things all in this coastal and marine space in California. So we think of fellows much more of than students or interns. You know, these are really um, early career professionals or professionals making that next step. Um, part of the eligibility requirements that we're talking about is somebody who's just graduated, just finished a graduate degree. Um, so a PhD, a master's, JD, or some type of uh, uh, in, a, in some type of relevant field um, is the type of eligible competitive applicants that we're looking for. Um, we're looking for folks who are, you know, while being trained and getting some experience, able to contribute to their host offices. Um, we see this as a joint partnership where you're being mentored, you're getting this experience, but you're also providing um, a, a, a high skill set to those hosts um, doing all this fantastic work. Um, and you're really seen as a colleague in many of these host offices and really put in places where you can learn about uh, the policy process, about um, how does science get funded or how do decisions actually get made about resources, whether well, that's coastal permitting, fisheries, water quality, and it's just a really exciting place to be for this one year educational opportunity. Um, and so again, this is an opportunity to gain more experience, more education and more training and learn when you finish with your academic studies. Um, a lot of the times we'll get questions about, you know, what do fellows go on to do? And I'll say everything. It's not uncommon for state fellows to continue on with the host that they were a fellow with or a sister agency um, where they met that, um, they met the supervisors of that new position or they, they understood this new agency based upon their fellowship experience. We have some fellows that go on to federal government, state government, local government, some in nonprofit, academia, and um, the private sector. So the whole slew of um, kind of career paths. And we try to provide these professional development opportunities where current fellows get to meet alumni from, a, from this broad um, career trajectory that they all go on to, to help give some more opportunities to understand like what's it like transitioning to private sector? What's it like going back to academia or what's it like staying in state or federal or local government? Um, something that's really exciting to announce and I, I hope some of you already saw it is that we've actually received the host applications and we have updated the tentative host placements for 2023. Um, so here's half of the list, but if you go to our website, um, again, I'll post that link in the chat for those that came in a, a little bit late. But you can see um, all the, the tentative host placements for 2023 on our website. And at the bottom of our webpage, um, there's PDFs of all the different position descriptions. And I'll show you where those are at. Um, I'll switch screens to, to our website in just a moment. But just skipping to the next slide, you know, we have a whole wide variety of opportunities based up um, in the Delta, looking at water quality, looking at Port of San Diego. We're excited for some of our newer um, hosts like the Tijuana NUR. Um, and I'll focus on this tentative word. Uh, many of you might have questions about this, and it's simply due to the fact that some, because of the fiscal year process, some budgetary items aren't certain. Um, these are all hosts who have the intent to support a fellow for 2023. And when we get to the timeline, I'll walk you through when we hope to have that finalized list of hosts for 2023. But this is the big slew of potential possibilities for fellows in 2023. And like I said, I'm just going to switch real briefly to our website. So if you go to our website, you'll see um, you can either click on this position descriptions here. It'll take you to the bottom of our page or scroll to the bottom of the page. All of these are PDFs of those descriptions, and you can download them as one giant PDF here or click on the individual um, more host descriptions there and learn more about those potential positions. Hopefully that answered some questions um, and I'm not seeing any in the Q&A, so I'm gonna keep going. So I think that's the next slide, yeah. So just some of the nuts and bolts. And again, this is this is on that webpage as well, just in terms of the stipend. So we, California Sea Grant does administer this word. We are housed at UC San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, so um, fellows are not employees of California Sea Grant. They're not employees of UC San Diego. They're not employees of Scripps and they're not employees of their hosts. Um, they are fellows. It's their own unique term for this classification. 
And so you receive a stipend. It's $4,292 per month that's paid in arrears. So um, you were a fellow for the whole month of February, and that stipend will be given to you um, at the end of February going into March. Uh, it's not ahead of time. And then we have a stipend to cover travel as well as professional development and training opportunities. So this could be going to conferences, getting more training on CEQA, getting more training on GE, GIS, um, or some more technical capacities, or we even have fellows that have done some conflict resolution, meeting facilitation, science communication. Um, the point of that is to cover not only physical travel as we move out of, um, you know, uh, some of the more COVID restrictions and a lot more conferences are being in person. There's not a lot more opportunities for in-person site visits and field work uh, to, uh, as well as it can cover, um, like I said, trainings and, and a lot of what's one of the positives of COVID is there are a lot of new opportunities for online certifications and trainings being offered by UC Extension um, and a whole slew of, of private organizations as well. So for eligibility, um, application, applicants um, must have recently completed a degree after May 1st, 2021. We do have a bit of a, a gap in there um, to allow for folks to take some time off after school, but um, we uh, fellows are required to complete all degree requirements before starting the fellowship. Um, I know we get that question a lot for some fellows who, or for some applicants whose graduation dates are a little bit more loose depending on the program that they're in. And so if you have a specific question, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but this is the eligibility requirements for this year's cohort. And so for those that are still in school and you're, you're not gonna be able to finish your graduate program until say mid 2023, then I would encourage you to keep an eye out for the 2024 competition for the state fellows, um, as well as some of the other fellowship opportunities that we have, such as the Canals. Running through the big timeline, um, like I said, you know, those are all tentative host positions currently. So come uh, about mid-July, mid we're hoping to finalize those once um, the fiscal year for certain, for the state in particular, gets more finalized. Uh, we will try to finalize our host positions um, on our website. Fellowship applications are due. I'm, I apologize if you can hear some background noise. There's a helicopter flying over, uh, but it just went away. Um, applications for the fellowship are due July 20th. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in just a moment about specific uh, about application, the specifics of the application, what you need to submit and all of that and how to. Then we go through a review process, um, which does involve an interview with California Sea Grant professionals. So um, just keep that July 25th to August 25th. That the second half of that time period is when we do a first screening of interviews for those finalists. Um, then we select finalists at the end of August. We were holding an informational webinar for those finalists that we're inviting to the matching workshop. Um, I can talk more about the matching workshop if, if interested, but just know that if you're invited to the matching workshop, you will be um, fully, fully instructed about all the ins and outs of the matching workshop and that whole process. Um, we have a series of finalist presentations, the hosts do presentations. Um, we go through a selection of interview, interviewing schedule for the finalists. And then um, we set that schedule and we have this matching workshop where uh, it's a great, it's an opportunity for a finalist to interview with multiple hosts to try to find a match. And so on the on the flip side, hosts get to interview multiple finalists to try to find that match. And for us, this is the perfect balance of professional interest, curiosity, as well as mentorship um, between that host, supervisor, and mentor with the fellow. Um, we got through this process in the, in the early half of October to announce fellows and matches. And then uh, fellowships begin between January to March, 2023. As you might have seen in our um, the request for applications for this opportunity, we are strongly encouraging that fellows start um, within the first week, first 10 days of each of those months. And that really helps reduce any um, perception of delayed stipend processing. But that's just a caveat I wanna say for, these, for this fellowship that again, it must start between January and March, 2023. I see there is a question. Oh, great. Great question. So the question is, um, can somebody apply until they're, uh, what? to be clear, one cannot apply until degree is completed or cannot start until degree is completed. So you can absolutely apply while you're finishing your degree. You just must complete all degree requirements before beginning your fellowship. And again, fellows must begin uh, between January and March of 2023. 
So based upon your situation, perhaps you're going to be finished in May or September of 2023. I would really encourage you to look at and plan for 2024 state fellowship or, um, or some of our other fellowship opportunities that might be on a different timeline. So that's a good question. So getting into the application requirements, and I see a question about that, so we'll get to it in just a moment. Um, so the application is, is pretty standard. There's a curriculum, vitae, CV, your resume that we really require uh, just two pages. Anything past two pages will not be put within your application. Um, a personal education curricular statement with an icebreaker. Uh, so there are some instructions upon this um, on our website, but really the icebreaker is to help to get to a better sense of your personality, uh, who you are, and we're really excited about this new aspect of our applications because we think it's going to really put a lot more um, creativity into this process. Two letters of recommendation. One has to be from your advisor. And if you don't have a formal advisor, it just has to be the, um, the individual, the professional that's most um, familiar with your academic work. And then copies of your grad undergraduate and graduate student transcript. And you heard me say copies are totally fine. Um, one thing I'll note about the CV, resume, and the transcripts, please, 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 you must redact all sensitive information from those documents before submitting them to us. I don't want to know your student ID. I don't want to know your date of birth. I don't want to know the fast, last four of your social. I don't want to know your phone number or your address. I don't want, we don't want any of that information. So if you could just take a, a good look before you upload those documents to make sure all that information is either not there or on a transcript, say that you use Redact in, in Adobe, or you add a you know add a black square to it in a word processing software, so that that information isn't attached to your um, application. That would really help us out a lot. And this is the perfect time to answer this question. So um, the question is: Are letters of recommendation due on July twentieth with the rest of our application? The answer is yes. Um, I highly, highly encourage you, if you haven't yet, and I, again, I apologize, there's a helicopter. I'm close the store, window. Uh, apologies if you could hear that. Um, uh, if you haven't yet identified your letter of recommendation writers, or you haven't spoken to these um, individuals yet, I really would encourage you today, after this webinar, to send that person an email. Um, if you happen to be, near that campus on campus and they happen to be in their office go knock on their door and talk to them about this this is often something that um especially now as we move towards summer and field work as ramping up especially with you know reduced covid restrictions um i know many uh um, academics are excited to get out of the out of the office and into the field so please reach out to those um letter writers as soon as you can to get this on their radar you still have plenty of time for those to be processed and written. So we have an online submission platform called EC Grant. It's extremely simple to set up an account. It's, it's essentially like setting up any account these days that you would on any other website or profile. Um, and so it does require a bit of a dual authentication. You'll receive a verification code, but is it very, very simple. And once you do that, you'll see um, an option to create an application, <laughs> excuse me, for the 2023 State Fellowship. And you can enter all of the different information that's required, upload your files, invite your letter writers to write letters on your behalf and submit those. Um, because it is an automated system, though, um, the portal will close at 5 p.m. on July 20th Pacific time. So there is no opportunity to submit late. It will not let you. Um, and there's nothing we can do about it. So I would really encourage you to create an account um, and go through that process, see what's required, look at all those application um, items that we talked about to make sure you have it in your head. Oh, this is what I need. Get familiar with it and ensure that you, you know, set set an internal deadline for yourself to make sure you're not getting up to that 5 p.m. deadline because again, it's automated. It will just close. Um, I see a question. Um, the question is like, I graduate in spring 2023. Can we still create an account if we are not applying? Um, yes, feel free to create an account, especially if you're interested in, in applying to us in the future. You know, this is an account, um, this port platform, EC Grant, is what we will use for all of our um, 
all of our future funded opportunities and, and competitions. I would also encourage you if you haven't yet to register for our newsletter. I'm hoping somebody from our team can find the specific web page for our newsletter. I don't have that offhand, but I could put that in the chat um, after this if we don't get to it. Oh, good question from Megan. Do people for let um, do our people for letters of recommendation have to make their own account? Or they can they send us the PDFs and we submit them ourselves? So that is a great question. Um, if you go into your the fellowship application kind of forms, it will be all um, it will clearly explain this. But essentially, they don't have to make an account, um, and you can't submit them on behalf on their behalf. Um, we want to make sure it's part of us authenticating these letters. We're not saying that there would be any um, malpractice, but to, to ensure authentication of these letters, they must be submitted by that person. So what you do is you essentially, you put in their name and email and our system will send them a, a message with a link where they can upload um, a letter in a PDF or, uh, uh, at their convenience, essentially. And you have the ability to track if they've received that um, link that you've sent them and if they've opened it and uploaded a file successfully. Hopefully that was clear and if not, I can, go in and show you. So you've submitted an application um, or as you're preparing for your application, I should say, you know, you want to keep in mind the evaluation criteria. And again, there, this is all split, explained in detail on the fellowship uh, request for application webpage. Diversity, appropriateness of experience, statement, communication skills, additional qualifying experience, academic ability, and letters of recommendation. Those are the main categories of criteria that you that the applications will be evaluated for and um, those that's how we're going to be reviewing all the applications come in to pick who we invite to join us at the matching workshop um, and while we're talking about the matching workshop you know there's a lot of caveats um, here in various sized fonts and italics and bolds but these are just important fine print for us to say to you all um, the matching process is is designed so that um, somebody doesn't come into this opportunity and say, I, I want to make sure I'm a fellow with host A only. We want to make, we want to create this experience where fellows come in with a sense of they're open minded to the experiences um, and the and the hosts, uh, even if it's something that you don't have a lot of academic um, background or training in that we've found very, very successful fellowship matches where somebody comes from a completely different field, but they fit fantastically at a host just because they can apply those skills that they already have in this new focus area. And or they just jive with that mentor so well that it's just this great collaboration between fellow and host mentor. So the actual assignments and matches are made upon this matching interview process at the matching workshop. Um, this year, it will be virtual, October 11th through 13th. Um, again, we went over that timeline, and if you were invited to the matching workshop, I promise you will get so much details about it. So um, I'm sure there's some questions about it, but there's if you get to that stage, you will have multiple opportunities to to clarify that. Um, and I I see that there's a typo in here. This should say 2022, 20, not 202. Um, finalists are required to attend the matching process and the matching workshop, and like I said. Placement in general, you know, you're not guaranteed placement if you're invited to the matching workshop. You're not guaranteed an interview with a specific host if you're invited to the matching workshop. And really, we can't guarantee a placement with a specific host at all for sure. So those that's some of the fine print. And we also ask that you don't, um, as an applicant to this process, that you don't reach out to the different host entities until the appropriate time um, as indicated through the matching workshop process. So. We, we want to make sure that we we give them all some space as we facilitate this matching process. Um, and so just encourage and, and ask that you don't reach out to those host supervisors and mentors. Um, so I'm seeing some folks put questions in the chat. Can you please put them in the q and a it just helps us manage. Um, oh, I just answered your question, Taylor. No, you are not guaranteed. Uh, if you were invited to the matching workshop, you're not guaranteed to be matched with anyone. So you, so you can walk away from the matching workshop without a host and without being coming a fellow. Um, 
you're not guaranteed an interview with a specific host. And of course, you're not guaranteed a match with that specific with any specific host either. So a few questions that can be helpful to ask yourself um, as you prepare your statement and your materials to send to us and even talking with your your letter of recommendation writers is, you know, am I writing a very specific, direct, concise goal statement, thinking about what this fellowship can bring to my career? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, did you describe any of the activities uh, that you've been a part of or that might be listed on your CV and, and how they might overlap and intersect with this fellowship opportunity? Did you provide any other background that um, can show us you're a, you're a balanced applicant and that you'd be a good fit for this fellowship? Um, another, another question about balancing is, you know, while we see very many accomplished um, academically, we want to make sure we have balanced applicants um, who come into this opportunity. Um, try to try to uh, define as many acronyms as you can. I know we all live in the acronym soup. And you know, just was it a good letter um, from the letter of letter of recommendation writers, excuse me, that showed some knowledge of the applicant and some understanding of how this fellowship opportunity would be great fit and help that applicant um, excel in their career trajectory and goals. So just a few tips. Um, all the pieces of the application are, are just part of a puzzle that we just sort of want to understand, you know, who you are as a person. What have you done? Where are you now? What are your hopes for the future? And how can this opportunity um, help get you there? That's our main question. And if your application answers that, it'd be that's a solid application. And I encourage you all to strive for that. Um, as we review applications and do some internal interviews of applicants before we invite um, finalists to the matching workshop, you know, we'll look at that, we'll look at your interview and try to understand, you know, who you are and how, again, how this fellowship opportunity is going to help you achieve your, you know, near term and long term personal and career goals. So, as I said at the beginning, you're going to view this as a educational and training opportunity. If, if there's one thing, one takeaway from this webinar is that when you hear the word Sea Grant Fellowship, you're hearing training, education, um, and experience. Uh, that's that's really what I want you to to take away from this webinar. And with that, you know, I'll, I know there's a question that I'll get to, but I just want to say, please look at the website. Um, I'll put the link again in the chat. Thank you, Carly, for putting a link to our newsletter. I really encourage you all to sign up for our newsletter. It's the best way to get updated about different opportunities, in particular, you know, our state fellowship, what we're talking about today. But we have several other research funding for current graduate students, um, training opportunities for recent graduates, and much, much more. Um, that's the best way to find out. Please look at our website. And, you know, again, thank you. And I'll answer questions now. Or open this window because it's getting hot. All right, Derek asks, uh, it's, is an applicant obligated to accept a match if offered a position that doesn't align with the applicant's goals? Can they decline the fellowship at that point? Yeah, you, yes, you know, I would say it's it does happen. Um, we don't prefer this to happen. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but I will say, you know, you are a fully autonomous human being. We are not forcing any decisions upon you. And if you get to a point where you're offered a match and it's it's a position that does not align with um, what you're hoping for, the, for this experience, or, you know, frankly, I would say what's more common is there's just life situations that come up where, you know, it's, it's just an opportunity that an individual can't take advantage of them at the time. Um, you're not obligated to accept or do anything, you know, that is up to you. We do have a sort of um, award acceptance letter, which does have some um, conditions that you will agree to upon receiving this fellowship award, uh, but that comes much lit, much later in the process, and it's it's a much formal uh, letter of fellowship award. Um, I will say though that you, if you do decline a match, you know we there's not an opportunity to be offered a match with a different host through this process. Um, Okay, no, I think there's a question in the chat. Let me get to it. What training opportunities can we expect beyond what would be included at a typical job? So this isn't a typical job. 
um, as I said, one of the main things you'll take away from this webinar, I hope, is that um, fellows are not employees of California Sea Grant, University of San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, nor are they employees of their hosts. They are fellows. It's their it's, its own unique designation. And what that word means when you hear it, the words that should come up are training, education, and hands-on experience. Um, but to answer your question is, you know, you do have formal stipend funding to for you to pursue uh, training and professional development opportunities that are really hyper specific to you. So if you want to learn, hey, I want to learn a lot more about sea level rise modeling. There's opportunities to do that. I really want to get better R or Python or GIS, something technical. You can use that training stipend for finding opportunities around that. You really want to go to this conference. You can use this training um, travel stipend for that. You really want to get it better at CEQA. You can use this training travel stipend for that. From the California Sea Grant side, we want to build a cohort with the fellows. So we'll offer opportunities for you to engage as a group. Um, we really like to build that sense of community, which is part of the reason we have everyone start in that January to March window, um, so that you can kind of all start around the same time. And so we'll try to build this cohort with you. We'll have opportunities for you to engage with our extension staff. You probably saw a little blurb about extension projects. These are optional opportunities to interact with our personnel who are across coastal California and in the Delta who are working um, at that realm of science to policy. And there's a whole wide variety of opportunities from field work to science communications and policy analysis and everything in routine in between. If you're really into coastal dunes and coastal resilience, you might interact with myself or Carly or others on our team and, and everywhere in between. Um, also, we try to provide different training opportunities. So actually this week, our current fellows were at a Margaret A. Davidson um, professional development training where we actually coordinated with the Sea Grant programs in uh, Washington, Oregon, Hawaii, and held this training for all of our fellows. And so hopefully this was uh, an opportunity for them to meet other like-minded, similarly um, placed individuals um, in, across the Pacific and the West Coast. And in this training, there was um, different um, sessions on negotiating starting salary, on where do you go after a fellowship, on navigating federal contracting, um, you know, very career oriented. Um, next month, we're um, through NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. They have a coastal trainings program. And so we're hosting for our fellows a training on meeting facilitation. Um, anyone can take these trainings, but this is something where we kind of prioritize that and host it for our fellows. And if, if you are interested in facilitating meetings ever in your career, I can't recommend that training enough, uh, to be honest. So hopefully that um, can answer some questions. And thanks, Leon, for putting that beautiful timeline you made in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of questions come in and I'm trying to get to them. Okay, there's um, a question. Um, I'm gonna drink a bit of water before I get to this one. All right, Rachel asks, uh, are people often placed in regions they currently live? So um, as you can imagine that through COVID and through remote, we're uh, remote life, hybrid life, virtual life. Um, it's been all sorts of flavors. Uh, our position now is that we're leaving it up to the hosts uh, to sort of determine for themselves how much in person, um, in person, this fellowship needs to be. Um, prior to COVID, for for all of the hosts, it was all an in person experience where. If it, you know, many of our hosts, as you might have seen, are in Sacramento. So, say for me, when I was not living in Sacramento, as I was going through the matching workshop process and contemplating um, being placed at a host in Sacramento, um, I made the decision that yes, I'm willing to move to Sacramento for a year to gain this training and educational experience. And um, there's a reason I'm now running this fellowship is because it was an incredible opportunity, and I highly support. Um, people taking advantage of it. So, you know, th there are some times where fe fellows currently live around that host office. And, you know, if that happens, fantastic, but that's not sort of a prerequisite. Um, and again, with, with COVID and as we go through the matching process, I'm encouraging the hosts to determine for themselves how much of an in-person opportunity this is. Um, I know some are 
very in person. I know some are very remote and I think it's everywhere in between, you know, to, because of hosts being in different counties um, at the time when we were all going through different county rules and regulations and because the hosts are in different governmental offices and have physical different office office space. There's just so many specifics that's gonna that that in-person versus remote um, hybrid is gonna be made at that host by host level. Sorry if that was a long-winded answer, but hopefully that I think I saw another couple other questions, but hopefully that answered. Um, yeah, there was like three other questions um, about the fellowship being fully in person or virtual hybrid. Um, I think I answered that. Will there be any remote positions or is the intention hope that all of these are to be in person? Hopefully I answered that. Are placements looking like remote in person? Hopefully I answered that. Um, and and Megan's question is, is there a way we can voice our preference of this during the workshop? So um, essentially how this how this will play out is as as you go through the interview process with us internally, and if you're invited to the matching workshop, um, once we get to the, in some of the host descriptions, they actually talk about it. So I'd encourage you to read the host descriptions because they do mention in some cases that they're open to remote. They view this as an in-person opportunity or they're open to hybrid within a certain time interval, you know, twice a month, three times a month, one week every two months. I am making those off the top of my head, um, but I think it's basically every everywhere in between those. Um, when the hosts give their presentations and as they explain these positions in greater detail, we're gonna really encourage them to explain what they want um, for their fellow. And I think that's a good time to really evaluate what you're comfortable with. And as, as you go into the matching process and start setting up interviews with those hosts, that's gonna be the time where you're gonna get to decide for yourself as, as a potential finalist of, hey, I'm comfortable moving to Eureka because this Caltrans experience, um, opportunity is just really great, or I'm not comfortable and now I'm looking at a different subset of the host. Uh, and so, you know, that's just something for you to, to think about as, a, as an applicant. And I, again, I can't encourage you enough to look at the position descriptions because there's some of it in there. It's not in every single one very clearly, but that will come out through the matching workshop process. And I think that was every question was about virtual and hybrid. And so I apologize. I probably should have made a slide, but hopefully I covered it all. I see that there was um, a question in the chat. Is this a part-time or full-time? Uh, fellows are expected to participate at a full-time equivalent of 40 hours per week for that 12-month period. Um, now, the day-to-day -day schedule um, will be determined by the fellow and their uh, host. Um, yes, that's the answer. Are there any other questions or I'm going to leave the line open for just a minute or two or any parts of our team that might want to clarify something that I may have said? So yeah. Nick, I just answered one question in the Q&A that was asking about whether our extension fellowship will continue. And so I just mentioned that our extension fellowships are only offered occasionally, but that the state fellowship does have the extension project where you do get to work with our extension team. Um, so I just thought I'd verbalize that. Thanks, Leon. I also answered a question in the chat about the locations of the fellowship. And again, I encourage you to check out the host um, descriptions because that will give you, or even just the host offices, because that will give you an idea of where they're located this year. Um, they're located throughout the state. They're not all in one city the same way it is for Knaus. Um, but a lot of them are going to be located in the state capital in Sacramento, just because that's where a lot of the agencies sit. Um, but there are tons of opportunities outside of that area. So you could end up as far south as San Diego or as far north as we've got some up in Humboldt. So really located throughout the state. Thanks, Carly. Um, and I see you're typing an answer to a question about extension fellowship. So I'll let you take that away. Um, Nathan has a question. I applied for a secret program last cycle, didn't move forward. Is there more of a chance second time around? Um, Nathan, I'd say that your your chances are probably the same, but I would just encourage you to really look at the evaluation criteria of the request for applications and really be thoughtful about your personal statement in meeting those evaluation criteria. Um, 
as well as talking with your letter of recommendation writers early about um, this experience and, and again, how this fellowship fits into your uh, career goals and professional development goals. That's gonna be the best way to set you up as the most competitive candidate. Megan asks, are there any resources, recommendations to view previous placement? Oh, are there any um, resources, recommendations to view previous placement deliverables or reflections to see what previous fellows got out of the program? Yes, so we used to require a blog. Um, it's no longer a requirement, though some fellows opt to do that as part of their extension fellowship. And so I'd encourage you, we just updated our website. So if you go to the news section, you should be able to filter by fellows. And then you can read both, you know, a couple years ago, fellows blogs, and then more recent opportunities from fellows of what they did, um, as well as we've also have announcements of each of the cohorts that's linked on the fellowship webpage. And so that you can see who, you know, what was the placement like for 2022? What was it like for 2021? And so on going back forth. Hopefully that could help you understand not only, you know, what does that placement look like, but then what fellows got out of the program. And, um, that leads to this next question is, can you describe a few of the projects that fellows have worked on? Um, so yes, lucky for you, uh, we have three state fellow alumni on this call and um, I'm gonna take a break from talking and I invite Carly or Madeline to explain, you know, what they got out of the, their own fellowships and where were, you, where were you hosted and all that. I can start. Um, yeah, I was a 2020 fellow and I was hosted by NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, which is in Oakland. Um, and I worked on a few projects. A lot of what OCM does is training and outreach, as well as facilitation of important conversations that are happening for the West Coast region and coastal resilience. Um, so I worked on a lot of projects that were bringing together federal agencies. Um, so I was working with EPA, EDA, HUD, lots of acronyms, but a lot of the big federal agencies um, that are working in the funding of resilience projects and bringing them to counties and cities in order to help um, figure out, bridge the gap between the projects that they're creating on the ground and the funding that's available at um, on the national scale. Um, and I also worked in our um, environmental justice program. I worked on a training for federal employees in order to better understand how to serve the diverse communities. Um, so I worked through a training with both the state fellows as well as with NOAA employees in order to get um, everyone trained up on how to best serve the communities. I also did an extension project um, and worked on dunes and that's how I ended up in this position that I have here today. Um, so I was working with Nick as well as some other Sea Grant staff as my extension project in order to interview dune practitioners throughout the state to better understand research gaps in um, dunes projects for coastal resilience. Thanks. Barb. I'll go next. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I was a 2019 state fellow with the Port of San Diego's Aquaculture and Blue Technology Program, and I assisted that team with. Um, conducting some pre aquaculture pre-development and permitting research in addition to applying for and securing permits for pilot projects um, that were ongoing or about to start during my fellowship. Um, but even though I was an aquaculture and blue tech fellow at the program, I also got to work a lot with the environmental conservation program there, helping with a living shorelines project permitting effort, which is now in the water and that's, a, um, an oyster uh, reef ball experiment down in South Bay, San Diego. So I got a lot of exposure to permitting. I got exposure to writing board memos and other um, uh, public agency type documents, which was definitely new for me coming straight from academia, but really great experience. Um, and I also got to help set up uh, um, a data dashboard to visualize vessel speed reduction or vessel speed um, data coming in and out of the Port of San Diego uh, to inform their vessel speed reduction program. So a lot of really diverse opportunities, um, even with quite a, um, a specific fellowship title, which was really great for me. Thanks, Madeline. 
And Megan, I, I just put in the Q&A um, a link to that news archive filtered by fellows that I mentioned. And so you can read about more recent and past fellows. And I want to thank um, Madeline and Carly for sharing their perspectives and lessons and some of their projects. Um, briefly, I was a 2015 state fellow with the Ocean Protection Council, and I worked on basically everything sea level rise related, um, a lot on managing grants to cities and counties doing sea level rise vulnerability with the hopes that those would be embedded in their planning um, processes. And um, now, and that led me to a job and then that led me to this job. So I can't encourage you enough how this fellowship, the state fellowship opportunity is a great springboard um, for your career path. I'm gonna leave the line open for any other questions. Um, I also put, uh, there was a question in the chat about taxability. And so I put a link um, that has information on that. But please use the Q&A for questions and answers. And if you have no other questions, I encourage you to go enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Um, it's beautiful outside where I am. And I imagine it's beautiful wherever you are. But this webinar, again, will be re is recorded. It'll be posted on our webpage. Um, if you have any hyper-specific questions, please reach out to sgproposal at ucsd.edu. And I'm not seeing any other questions. I'll leave the line open for one more minute before I close this webinar. But again, really excited. And thank you all for joining us today. We're looking forward to getting to meet many of you. We hope you really take the time that you have. I know I put about an hour and a half for this webinar, so you have a bunch of time left that after this webinar, you can go to EC Grant. You can make yourself an account if you haven't yet. You can think about who you want as a letter writer, maybe send them an email to set up a phone call or grab a cup of coffee or tea, whatever is your jam, and get started on your application because there's no better way than today. And with that, I'm not seeing. Thank you all for joining. Um, you all are all welcome. Thank you all for the, the pleasantries and thanks in the chat and the Q&A. Um, really appreciate you coming to the webinar. Um, I'm going to stay on for another minute, but I invite you all to keep, uh, to, to keep uh, leaving the webinar unless you have any other specific questions. And there goes, it's 1250. So I am going to propose we sign off. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Carly, Leon, Madeline for, for coming today and supporting and sharing info. And I wish you all a great afternoon. Thanks, all right, thank you all so much. Thank you.